there are things we do every day where science impa impacts us, but it's so seamless that we don't, we're not even aware of it, whether it's having to uh, take a shower in the morning and have the curtain flow towards you due to a Bernoulli effect, or whether it's uh, driving the, your car. Uh, you can drive a car without having to know, you know how, to, how the pistons work or anything like that. Whether you drop a pencil and you scoot your chair back to pick it up or all that. And then not only the, the, the common stuff, but then I'm watching TV now because I'm an old guy. And I'm seeing things that just is unbelievable for me, like people that are talking to the TV. Not that they're cussing out their team that lost or made a bad play, but they're giving the TV directions on what programs were to pause and doing it by audio signal. So I was hopeful that we could use something kind of exotic, building rockets, because that's not something we do normally every day, and see how the principles of the STEM, uh, science, technology, uh, engineering and mathematics might impact it. Talk a little bit now about history of rocketry, talk about the principles that are involved, and then we'll start building the rockets, okay? Then after that, we'll go out in the field and we'll put together our launch rack and we'll fly the rockets. Um, rocketry has been around for a long time. Uh, anybody have an idea how long? You guys probably studied this stuff. The ancient Chinese, or the Marco Polo. Who did this? Say again. Twenty-five hundred years. I don't know. It's, it's like the fourteen hundreds or so, and it was the Chinese. They wanted to do, uh, protect their territory from Mongol hordes that were coming around, and so uh, in the fourteenth century or thirteen hundreds, they uh, they put up rockets and such, and, and uh, I guess it was about another two hundred and fifty years. Somebody got the idea that they could go ahead and try to figure out the basic principles that make it, made it work. It seems to me that rocketry, although we have these great milestones in space, such as people walking on the moon or the Hubble Space Telescope or going visiting the International Space Station, these carriers that we have typically were had for military purposes, such as keeping the, the Mongols from invading your land. 200 years ago, next year, we're going to be celebrating the bicentennial of what? The uh, Fort McHenry and the Star Spangled Banner and the bombs bursting in air. These were Congreve rockets that were developed in England and hopefully trying to keep uh, the Americas uh, back in the British fold. That's what their, their hope was. It didn't work out that way. When we sent our first satellites into space, the Sputnik, back in 1957, that was aboard a military rocket. Russia had suffered a terrible defeat during the Second World War of having all their aircraft destroyed. And so after the Second World War, they had to get their aircraft industry back together. And they also sought other ways of, of going into, uh, into space and deliver war systems by using what the Germans had developed in the Second World War with the V-2 and the A-4 type rockets. And uh, so they adopted uh, one of their, their, what they call their R-7, put a satellite on top of it and sent it up into space on October the 4th, 1957. When we started sending our satellites up, our first satellite was what? Do you remember what that one was called? It was some kind of an explorer for us. It was called Explorer 1, and it was launched on January the 31st, 1958. And it was on a uh, Jupiter C rocket, which was a a carrier that we were going to use for weapon systems. When we launched our first astronaut into space, that was Alan Shepard back in May 5th, 1961. That was aboard a Redstone, another rocket carrier. The next fellow that went up into space for the United States that went into orbit, our first orbiting astronaut, not Yuri Gagarin, he went up on a Soyuz spacecraft, also a military rocket. Ours was John Glenn. He went on an Atlas rocket, which was an Air Force uh, mission to deliver weapon systems. Uh, fortunately now, I mean, when we launch our rockets, they're more civilian and they give us these spectacular views of space from like the Hubble Space Telescope and going in. Uh, led to a history of uh, 35 years with the space shuttle, and 135 missions with that. Uh, early rocket pioneers were Dr. Robert Goddard, Konstantin uh, Eduardovich Tsiolkovsky, he was a Russian 
lived in Kaluga, Russia. And the third was a guy by the name of Herman Ober. He was born in Romania, but uh, that part kind of became annexed to East Germany, so we, the Germans claim it. And those were the three rocket contemporaries. All three of them were influenced by, guess what? Jules Verne and H.G. Wells and science fiction. So uh, fiction and what you see in the movies can inspire you to, to go on to greater things. Dr. Goddard was the first to make a rocket that worked using liquids for fuel, liquids having a, a higher specific impulse or kick in the can to allow the rocket to go up faster and higher and eventually leave the bounds of Earth. He published a, tra uh, a tract in 1919 called A Method of Reaching Extreme Altitudes. Smithsonian paid for it and was distributed. People thought that it was kind of interesting. He said that it was possible to go to the moon, maybe you could put some photographic flash powder on the rocket, have it flash in the moon, show you that it actually hit, hit the moon. People said, well, no, I'm not sure that really worked because once you get above the atmosphere, there's no air to push against. There's no air to push against, and the rocket won't work. It can't go all the way to the moon. It'll just go up to the atmosphere, and then when there's no air, it'll fall back down. So someone needed to uh, find the natural principles of mathematics and, and, uh, and say that was not correct. You can go to the moon, as we obviously did 42 years ago. And that fellow that, uh, that came up with the principles that guide all rocketry, whether it's Dr. Roberts, uh, Goddard's rocket, or the space shuttle, or the Saturn V that took our astronauts to the moon, was a guy by the name of, hmm, anybody you know? Who had their principles of motion? It was Sir Isaac Newton. And he did this in uh, 1657. And he came up with three laws of motion that I'm going to lay on you right now. And that will govern the rockets that you build today, just like the big rockets that, they, that NASA flies. And its first law of motion I call the couch potato motion. Uh, and that is uh, someone that is sitting at a couch watching TV will remain watching TV until a commercial comes or, you know, something happens. Unfortunately, back in 1657, they didn't have TV. So uh, all you could do is... I don't know, sit around a tree and watch apples fall or something like that. And so his first law of motion he called the law of inertia. And they, it, it reads, if you if you've been a text, that a body at rest will stay at rest. And a body at motion will stay in motion in a straight line, infinitely going on until it's acted upon by some exterior or external force. Okay? That was the first law of motion. Now, how he developed this is kind of interesting. You're going into school uh, here, and every now and then we have interruptions of school. Apparently not holidays, because you're here on Columbus Day. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, he was taking about a two-year sabbatical when he came up with this law of motion. He was at a relative's farm because they had a bad case of plague that was hitting the area. And so they said, all right, uh, Cambridge, uh, school's out for a couple of years until everything is cool, and then we can come back to school and continue our studies. So he was out at a relative's farm when he saw apples falling from a tree. This is the, the urban legend. I don't know if that's really what happened, if it bonked him on the head or he just observed it or what he... And he was trying to figure out what makes things work like that. And uh, so he came up, and then he printed it all out in a book, and uh, his book was called Principia Mathematica de Naturalis, or Natural Principles of Mathematics, or Principia or mathematical principles of nature. And uh, he wrote it in Latin, although he was English, because everybody was writing things in Latin. Left over from the Middle Ages, but the priests were, were, were writing down everything. All, all science was being written in Latin. So if you were Polish, like Copernicus, you could read Kepler's Law of Motions, well, if you were alive then, uh, uh, even though he was English. Or if you were Taco Bry and you were Swedish, you could uh, read his work because all in the common was Latin. That was the lingua franca at that time. Just like if you go overseas today, English seems to be the common language that people will understand you with. All right, so that's what he, he wrote it down. And his first law of motion, again, was a body at rest will stay at rest, and a body at motion will stay in motion in a straight line and travel there infinitely. Okay, and that affects the rockets that we launch. Second law of motion that he had which is a pretty cool one, we call the law of acceleration. And it reads something like this, that if you're going to have a body change its direction 
or change its motion, it's going to be proportional to the magnitude of the force that's being directed on it and in the direct direction that that force is going on. Okay. So they simplified that and made it a mathematical terms. And the, the equation that came out is said was force equals mass times acceleration. And that is the typical force that will operate on the rockets that we're going to build today. Third law of motion is the one you're probably most familiar with, which is every uh, body's motion has an opposite uh, uh, direction impact, or for every action there's an opposite and equal reaction. That's a short way of saying it. And, uh, so we'll see that in play. I'm going to get a rocket out and show it to you. So we're going to demonstrate the first law of motion. I'm going to put it right by you, all right? All right, now watch this very carefully. What's that first law of motion? Please help me. Right, until it's active. Well, all right, so let's watch it. Tell me when something happens. <laughs> Kick the table, <laughs> something. All right, so that's, that's it at rest, all right? thing is, well, we actually know it's not really at rest because we're in motion, too. So that's it. Now, if you took this, and I should, that same law of motion should say that I should be able to throw this, and this should go, keep on going. Well, if I tried to throw it, you can see, obviously, it's not going to go very far. Why? Because it's going to hit the wall, or gravity's going to affect it, or air resistance is going to affect it. But if it wasn't for gravity and air resistance and the wall, this thing would keep on going in a straight line is what you posturize. Now, if it would accelerate, if it go, if it go uh, faster, because when a rocket starts like this, if this is a moon rocket, it would have to travel 25,000 miles an hour, wow, to leave the bounds of the Earth to reach the moon 240,000 miles away. If you just wanted to go into orbit only 100 miles up, you wouldn't have to go 25,000 miles an hour, 8 miles a second. You could do a simple 18,000 miles a second, I mean 18,000 miles an hour. And to do that, how would you get this thing to go that fast? It starts out at zero speed, and it's traveling eventually five miles a second at 18,000 miles up, I mean 18,000 miles an hour around the Earth, 100 miles up. And what happens is you've got a force that's coming out of this, and that force, even if it remains the same, you're consuming rocket fuel. And so the mass, even though the apparent size of it is still the same, the mass is becoming smaller and smaller. So in order to even stay that, that same force, that same equilibrium, and Dr. Kahn likes equilibrium, all right, then the acceleration has to increase. So the rocket would go faster and faster until it eventually uses it. One of those old rocket pioneers, uh, Siakovsky in Russia, he said, well, you can make it even easier if you had your rocket as trains. You hit, like, this is a train here, this is a train here, this is a third train. So we call them stages. So you drop off a stage, you drop off some of the mass, you increase the acceleration, and you eventually get this thing going 18,000 miles an hour. Have you all, been, you all been to the Air and Space Museum in Washington? And you've seen the space capsule the Apollo people came? What is that thing? That's about 10 feet tall. Okay. Well, that's the only part of the rocket that came back. The Saturn V rocket was 366 feet tall. But by successively dropping off the trains or the stages, we got that part to go to the moon and then used the gravitational forces and rocket thrusters to bring it back. It took about three and a half days to get there and back. How about that? 42 years ago. All right, so, the, so body at rest, we take takes off, it starts to accelerate. That force is going to equal mass times acceleration. Just kind of an neat thing. I'm going to share you with one other thing. I'm going to tell you a story about speed bump. And I'm going to tell you about a slug of metal, only about yay big. Speed bump is a, a friend of mine who was working on his Volkswagen, and he was underneath the thing, and he hooked up two wires, and he didn't realize the thing was on in gear. And so it started up, and he had the pleasure or the displeasure of watching the thing roll over him and roll down the street. It was going so slow that he he wasn't injured. He when he knew his car was going to run into something, so he jumped up, not thinking of his injury, and ran down the Volkswagen, put on the handbrake, and the, and the Volkswagen stopped. And then he started to worry about what in the heck just happened to me. Well, so if you have something that is very large and very massive, but it's traveling very slow, it might only exert a little bit of force, is what I'm saying. But suppose you have something a little, just maybe a half an inch wide, about yay long, 
If you can trap, take that little piece of metal like that and throw it really fast, hundreds of feet per second, you know what we call that? We call it a 50 caliber bullet. So even objects that are small, little finger size, that are traveling hundreds of feet per second can exert a massive amount of force. NASA has a series of satellites that they call the A-Train. It has nothing to do with Duke Ellington. What it has to deal with is five satellites that are traveling in the same orbit. They follow one after another, so that they'll all come over about the same local area, bing, 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 bing. One measures uh, atmospheres, one does temperatures of water and, and so forth, so they each have different sensors. But we have space objects, space junk that comes down and could impact their, uh, the spacecraft. And so what happens, uh, all I can say is, Ethan, you've got to get out of the way of these things because uh, what's going to happen is the, the object could hurt the spacecraft. So we have to adjust the orbit of all five spacecraft to get out of ways of, of uh, little bits of space paint, things, flecks of, of objects, of uh, junk from other spacecraft so we don't hit these things. And there's lots of stuff out in space. All right, so that's the force equals mass times acceleration, law of acceleration. All right? Hope I didn't bore you all on this. What questions you got? Got it. Okay, that's great. Now, now let's, do the, uh, let's do the rockets, all right? We're going to build Alpha 3s. Probably some of you have built model rockets before, uh, but this is great. What we're doing, we'll launch your rockets first, and Dr. Khan has asked uh, that we have some other rockets to launch, so we'll launch this one. Hopefully it won't go 18,000 miles an hour, 100 miles up. And uh, he was talking about an egg rocket. Do we have such a thing? Unfortunately, Dr. Khan, I brought the egg rocket. I'm giving the egg. And even, even worse than that, buddy, I brought the egg. Cool. We're going to put an egg up here. It's in here. I've got it uh, all wrapped up so it won't crack. And then we'll see if the yoke's on me, all right? And then, in addition to that, I've got this one I built. I'm most proud of this one, and I'll tell you why. Because it took me longer to build the box than it did the rocket. But this is, see, look at this. I even put Velcro on the thing. I built this just for you guys. Believe me. I built a blue glider. I built my own space shuttle. I know you're dying to see what this thing looks like. There it is. And it's going to have a little booster. Oh, this is going to be so much fun. Like this. And it's going to go on there. And I'm going to boost it vertically like this. And then the game plan is that it'll punch out a streamer right there. This will deploy come down nice and safe, not leaving a crater more than a foot in the ground. And then this guy right here should glide away, and uh, if we're lucky, maybe it'll hit Pennsylvania, okay? So there's, that's what, so that's what we're, we're going to do later today. So that's what we're going to do. You're going to build an Alpha 3 rocket, and Alpha 3 will look like this. Parts of the rocket you should know about are the, what do they call these things? Fins. What do fins do for a rocket? Why do I need fins? Stability of flight. Stability of flight, right. Fins on a rocket act like feathers do on an arrow. If you took an arrow and you took off the fins on it, or the feathers, and you tried to shoot it, it would probably tumble like a uh, pencil or something, you know. And so in order to keep the rocket from not tumbling, you use fins. Aerodynamically, when a rocket flies, it's got a lot of forces going at it. It has the force of the rocket engine providing thrust in one direction, and that's the action. The rocket moving in the other direction, that's the reaction. But it also has air blowing against the fins, which act somewhere like veins on a weather vane. It has gravity, and it has air resistance of going uh, as the rocket travels, so, uh, which they call drag. So these are the fins. What do you think this... Uh, this nose cone has an interesting name. You know what it's called? Well, that's the kind. That's the shape of it. That's, a, that's pretty good. 
Now, this is called a nose cone. Okay, so that's what it is. <laughs> nose cone. This body tube is called a? Body tube. Right. I knew you'd catch on quick. And the straw is called a? Launch lug. Launch lug. Right, not a straw. There's a trick question. Everything has a, its own terminology. You're taking nursing. You're taking medicine. You're taking uh, anyth anything. Um, everything has a patois or a jargon or, uh, or, or name for it. The, uh, this one has a, oh, this one has a parachute? Cool. Right, your parachute will look like something like this, too. Have a big piece of elastic to keep the rocket together so you don't have to chase it all over the place. Two separate pl places. This elastic is called the shock cord. The string that, co that covers the, uh, holds the parachute together is called shroud lines. There's a little screw eye here in the nose cone. It's called a screw eye. And I think that's about it. There's an engine hook on the back end. That's to keep the rocket engine uh, in place because the way the rocket engine works, it's made out of paper, believe it or not. I'm running out of hand. Well, I hope that stays at rest. All right. It's made out of paper. It has black powder in it. We launch it by putting a thin little wire in the back end where there's a little nozzle. And then we, uh, we don't light it with a fuse. We use electricity from a battery. I've got two car batteries. Why? I don't know. That's what I brought. And anyway, you put that voltage through that wire, and that wire will glow red hot like a filament would be in a light bulb. And that's what starts the rocket engine. The nozzle is tapered. It's kind of bell-shaped. So the gas that results from the uh, black powder being ignited is expelled out the back end. It's very small, just little parts of gas, but it's traveling literally thousands of feet per second, and that generates the force, the action, for the rocket to move in the opposite equal reaction. The rocket engine is consumed kind of like a cigarette, providing the power going the rocket up. At the top end of the rocket engine, there is a smokeless trail to allow the rocket to coast to reach its highest altitude. I, I'm thinking your rockets are probably going to go about 75 to 100 miles an hour. They're probably going to go about 150, maybe 300 feet in about a second and a half. Wow, okay. And so what happens when the fuel gets up to this top part, there's a big hole at the top, and the gas has a choice of either exiting this hole at the top, big hole right near where it is, or it can travel all the way back down to the end of the rocket engine and go out that teeny little hole. So where do you think it take goes? It goes out the top, it takes the path of least resistance. And what that does is it pushes out the nose cone and the parachute, kind of like a piston, and that's what deploys this, and then hopefully we'll get it back and knock into a tree. Okay? But when that gas comes pushing out here, what happens? The rocket tries to move in the opposite and equal direction, right? So we have a little hook at the end to keep the rocket engine from being expelled, because if the rocket engine was expelled, maybe the nose cone would stay on, and then this would come down just as fast as it went up. 100 and some odd miles an hour, 75 to 100 miles an hour. All right, well, those are the little parts, okay? Cool. You all ready for this? I went to your cafeteria, and guess what I found? Boy, this, this is the place to live, I'll tell you. Blue trays. Blue trays. If you go to the cafeteria, you will not find blue trays. You know why? Because I have them all. That's the answer, okay? There you go. There you go. Oh, I'm sorry you guys get no blue trays. I only had... A few trays, so I'm so sorry. You'll have to sell for red trays. <laughs> All right, so there. Now open up those darn things and put them in the. Uh, the purpose of the tray is there's lots of little parts like the launch lug and the screw eye, and uh, I really don't want you fumbling around on the floor. So put everything in the tray and it has a lip on it, and we'll satisfy it. Now, let's see. Our first step. All right, Kevin, I'm going to look at yours. Okay. First, so it gives you a part layout. It tells you everything. It gives you some more parts than, than we talked about. There is a Blue Robin uh, engine mount tube. You'll, you, you'll see it probably in there, okay? And there'll be some centering rings. They're usually green. And I think the first thing I want to do is to take the engine hook. And you'll see on the engine mount tube, that's the Robin Blue 
uh, tube. There should be a slit at one end. And you put the engine hook onto that slit. And you get it there? Okay. All right, I want to borrow your thing. All right. Kevin did that. This is what it looks like in your face, okay? Okay. All right, there you go. The next step is what we're going to do is we're going to secure that engine hook by the little band which is looks like a cigar band. So here's how you do it. I'm going to borrow Ethan's, all right? Yep, that's perfect. Uh, open that guy up and give me the cigar band, please. Oh, my goodness. I'm so sorry. Yeah. All right. Oh, this is one. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to glue this little ring, this is what they call a centering ring, onto the engine mount tube about halfway down. This is what it's going to look like. Here's how we do it. You don't mind me doing yours this time? Okay. I'm going to suggest this. You take your useless glue, okay, and you put... You put around the middle just a small bead of glue. It doesn't have to be a lot. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and just make it a, a small, even bead of glue. And then once you've done that, then slide that centering ring on top of the glue, wipe off any excess glue, and then wipe it off on, on, on the rag I gave you. This is water-soluble glue, so it will come out of a wash if you, if you get it on your clothes, but I just assume you wouldn't. But the whole bottom line of it is when you're finished, your engine mount tube secured should look like this. Like that, okay? Go with it. Yeah, little, you want to put glue right around there and then slide it down. Okay? All right? So that's what it's going to look like when it's finished. Perfect. You, you've done this before. Okay. All right. All right. Now, what are the, what's the next step? Oh, I know what the next step's going to be. We're going to, you have two, you have two green centering rings, one with a slit in it and one that's uh, unslitted. Okay. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the slitted ring and glue it on the end of the engine mount tube. May I borrow this? And here's what we're going to do. We're going to glue this guy and at this point, I turn around and smile at the camera because I've been looking at my back for a while. All right? And we're going to go ahead and glue that such that the engine hook goes through where the slit is. So this is what the final assembly will look like at this end where the... Okay? See? Yeah. I suggest that you go ahead and after you wipe that out, that's the way it's going to look. Here's what I'm going to suggest. Uh, if, whether you're building a rocket or uh, furniture, you'll find that the, the way to success is to use a little dab will do you, as they said in the old real cream ads. I went to the library and saw those ads. I don't have any direct experience with them. All right. Just a little bit of glue. Thank you. And then wipe off any excess glue. You're just doing this one ring. Don't do the other ring. Okay? Oh, gosh. I want to keep this one. I think this is a good job. All right. This, that's what it looks like. You know what you're doing. Okay. Do we ever do? All right. <laughs> no, you're, I don't, don't, don't want you to even look. You're so intent on what you're doing. Okay, so you see what we're doing? We're gluing now. Yeah, okay. Oh, you guys are great. Okay, now we'll put this thing aside. And now, I think what we're going to do is we're going to pass out the useless scissors. Hold on. Easier than building a robot. Oh, yeah, much easier. I can tell you that. Who wants the pink scissors? 
Okay. All right, there you go. Oh, people. Now you guys get the pink. Now you'll find out why they're called useless scissors. Okay. Blue to match? You got blue? Uh, no. Yeah, that's what's good. You got it. Hey, there's scissors that'll challenge you. Okay. Oh, I look like I can handle that one. I'm going to give you the sharp ones. Can I trust you, sharp ones? Who else I gave a wicked pair of scissors to? Are you? Okay. Well, like Dr. Raza said, we I teach elementary school kids, too. All right, so let's see what do we do. Oh, I know. I want you to, you'll love this part. I want you to be a cutout. Here's what we'll do. Let me borrow yours. On page two of your syllabus, you'll see right here something that's called a shock cord mount. You two, uh, Kate and, and Jill, you'll have to be psychic, okay? You're going to have to cut this out if you're, if you're a psycho either. All right, so we're going to cut around the outside edges of that, okay? So when you're finished, this is what it's going to look like. Yes, I'm ruining the paper. Don't cut through the dotted lines. You want your trapezoidal figure... Isn't that the right term for this? Trying to do it? Yep. Oops, sorry. Okay. Right. 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 This is what it looks like when you face it. This is called a shock cord mount. The purpose of this is to secure the shock cord to the body tube, and then the end of the shock cord will go to your nose cone. So, the, first of all, we're going to make this little mount. God bless you. Oh, thank you. Okay. Let's see how you did. Perfect. Okay. Let me borrow yours as an example. Okay. And here's what we're going to do with our shock cord mount. You really actually believe we're going to be finished at 2.30? Yes, we are. Okay. We're going to take a little dab of glue. And we're going to put it right on section one. A little dab will do you. So that if you just want to watch right now, see all I've done is smeared it on, on the section one. And I'm going to take the end of the shock cord and put it right now so that it's on section one. And I'll fold section one onto section two. This is not that complicated. So when you're finished, section one will be all glued onto section two. Then I'm going to, having no imagination, I'm going to take the glue and put it onto section two and fold it over to section three. So when you're finished, your trapezoid will now look like this. The top of a tea bag. Okay? That's what you want to, that's what you want to finally get. Yeah. Um, Mr. Grayson, we have a question for you. That you want it long way down, not straight, not across. I mean, do you have that in there, like that? Or yep, side? that's just like that. You got it right. No matter which side? Nope. Doesn't matter. I've never seen anyone ever do it that way before. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you're right, it doesn't make a difference from the side. Sure. Hey, great. Let's see how you're doing. Oh, uh, you're meticulous. Okay, excellent. Great. Oh, you're going to town. Everybody's glue's working? Oh. Your glue doesn't work? No, it doesn't. Okay. Yeah, there's. No, 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 no. Like this. Yeah, you're doing great. Yeah, you can make a tea bag. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, while you're doing that, let's get the, let that dry. Let's take that little part that everyone wants to lose, the screw eye, and screw it into the nose cone.
You know, it comes that big orange thing and it's ogive, I understand, in shape. What questions do you have about rocketry or anything right now? Okay, thank you for letting me off the hook. <laughs> did you launch out of any uh, clubs locally? Yeah, we do. Uh, in this county, I think it is in this county, we launch near Mount Airy on the third Saturday of the month. Uh, my group is called narhams.org. You can look that up on the web. N-A-R-H-A-M-S. In Centerville down on Eastern Shore off 301. Yeah, we launched this smaller stuff than what you're doing. We also launch at the Goddard Space Flight Center on the first Sunday of every month from 1 to 2. You can bring your rockets. And I have uh, literature that I will pass out before you leave. On No, at Goddard we do this kind of rocket. Narham's mid-power. G's and H's, but never nothing like an I or a J. Do you have a rail? We have, uh, we have the same type of rack system you'll see, which is a launch rack with six positions, and we have three six-foot-high rods and rails that you can use. All right, so everything good there? All right, let's go back to the... Syllabus? Yeah, no, not the syllabus. <laughs> let's go to this guy again. What we're going to do, let me borrow your glue as an example... We're going to glue the shock cord mount into the body tube. We're going to do it, just, just listen, first of all. We're going to glue it inside here somewhere. But we want to do it about a knuckle down, maybe two knuckles down, because your nose cone is going to go on your rocket. And so if we glue this right up here at the top, or near the top, then the shoulder of the nose cone is going to interfere with it. So we've got to recess this shock cord mount down a little bit, so that when the shoulder of the body, uh, the nose cone goes onto the body tube, it does not come in contact with the top of the tea bag. Okay? So, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put some glue, just a little bit, and then smear it around onto that little bag, the shock cord mount. Then I'm going to put the shock cord mount inside the body tube and down about an inch or so. So when I'm finished, this is what it looks like. See how far it is down there? You see how far that, oh, you know that. See how far that is down there? Okay. See that? All right. See it's recessed? Yeah, you, you can tell by how your fingers are, okay? Okay, good? Yeah, I like that, that's good. Okay. Sure. Okay. All right, let's see what we're going to do next. Okay. We're all through with that? Yeah. Next step we're going to do is we're going to put the parachute on the nose cone. Here's how we're going to do that. Now, this is just you watch this part. Let me borrow yours and do it. Can you open, use that? Use, use the scissors. And I didn't bring band aids. Good. What am I doing with this? This is a spawn to it. Okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's how we do this. You've got your little parachute, and it's in like a little spike. Thread your fingers through the loops. I have three loops. And then turn it upside down, and your parachute is now like a picnic basket, okay? All right. This is cool, isn't it? Okay. Then you're going to take your nose cone that has the screw eye in it and you are going to thread those three those three loops that's on your index finger right through that hole oh yeah okay easier said than dunnies 
So when you're finished, it looks like this. You have to pay attention. Okay, it looks like that. All right. This is what it looks like in this thing. All right, you got it. Okay. All right, you're doing it. I want everyone to look at Kevin now. Make him nervous. <laughs> <laughs> He's the last no one. No pressure on you, buddy. Okay. Here's what you're going to do. Once you've got this thing through, you still have to keep that, those loops open. Take the top of the parachute and thread it through it, right through those loops, and then pull it straight out. And what you've done is you attach the parachute to the nose cone. Great. Dr. Bird is heaven. Make that something. Thank you. Oh, that was awesome. Oh, my goodness gracious. Kate and Jenny did that like they've done it before. Okay, you have? Okay. Awesome. How about you? Great. Oh, he's taking a Coke break. All right. Oh, cool. Yeah. Pepsi. Pepsi. All right, Pepsi. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Okay. You got those open? Thread them through, buddy. Pull it out. Let's keep pulling, man. You got it. All right. Next step. We are going to go ahead back to the engine mount tube, and here's what we're going to do. You don't mind me borrowing this, do you? All right, we're going to go ahead and take the uh, engine mount to assembly and we're going to thread it through the bottom of the fin can unit so that the engine hook is between two of the fins. And the top of the engine mount tube sticks out the top of the fin can unit. The green centering ring is completely hidden. So this is what it will look like when you're finished. Alright. Keep on trucking. Alright, is it between the two fins? Alright, very good. Right there. Excellent. Right. Oh you guys are good. Okay. Now, with that, then you're gonna take some of the glue, what that other ring, put it around the just a thin bead of glue around the top, smear it around so it's nice and neat. Ooh. Okay, you know, sometimes these, these, these don't fit. Before you put that ring on, before you put the ring on, take your nose cone and remount the ring a little bit. Make it a little bigger if it doesn't fit. Because then you'll find that when you put the centering ring on top of the engine mount tube, it'll fit very nicely. Wipe off any excess glue. Neatness counts. Remember what they used to tell you in high school? Straight A, start with a clean locker. Okay. Okay. So this is what it looks like when it's finished. I mean, that is on there secure. There's no wiggle room or anything. You see that? No wiggle room or anything. All right. Okay. See that? Yeah. Okay. See how that is? All right, you got it. Both that glue in Okay. Yeah, no, no pressure. How do you do that? You got it. Okay. All right. Okay. What are we gonna do now? Yeah. What the heck? We'll do that. <laughs> Too tight. Yeah. Did you ream it out a little bit? Let's, yeah. Let's do it some more. All right. We get that thing in there. Good. I'm even going to go back a step. I'm going to put some more glue on there to make it even worse. Ready? 
Oh, I want that thing between the fins. You get a half, half twist. Okay, there. No problem. the end of the shock cord and tie it to the nose cone at where the, uh, through the screw eye. So at this point, here, here's what I'm saying. Your turn, right? Your turn, sir. Oh, cheater. <laughs> okay. She wasn't going to tell you. That's right. You Take this guy, here you go, the shock cord, and put it right through the end of the screw eye. So it's about this far out. And then I want you to tie three overhand knots. They're also called granny knots, named after a famous kind of apple. Yeah, granny, you've heard of granny apple? Oh, yeah, granny Smith. Tie three of them in a row. Okay. So when you're finished, you got your, your assembly looks like that. I should caution you, granny apples have nothing to do with granny nuts. I don't want to leave you misled on that. All right. So Okay. Yes, what is a granny knot? What? What is it? Just the kind you start with. Overhand. Yeah, just a shoelace. Yeah, shoelace type. Yeah, right. All right, if, when you're all finished with that, I have a treat for you. Are you all through? You're a band, bro. Shock cord. The shock cord. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is called a square knot. Right over left, left over right. They're used with two ends that are the same diameter, and so when it pulls, it pulls equally on them. Again, it's right over left, left over right. Do the square knot. We're going to take the fin unit and we're going to glue it to the body tube, opposite end of the shock cord. So what you want to do is just do a test fit, make sure that this will fit in. And if it does fit in good, then put some glue on the inside of the body tube, like this, just on the inside. Smear it around. Kind of inside of the body tube. Inside of the body tube. And then take the fin unit. Oh, that's okay. That'll, it'll work that way as well. But this is the way I do it. And then turn it and then give it a twist so that they glue. And then set your rocket upright. Now it's starting to look like a rocket, right? Right? It's your turn, right? Uh, no. <laughs> it shouldn't be. You save on me or twice, right? We're going to take a launch lug and... The instructions say put it here about the center of gravity, but I find that's a little too rough. Use your fin uh, joint between the fin and the, and, the, and the tail cap and just glue your straw or your launch lug onto the side so it'll look something like, well, not like that. I don't know. That's what I'm going to You only put a little bit, just a little dab of glue. Do you put it on the same side? Yeah, you can put it on the same side or a different side of the, where the hook is. But something like that. Yeah, and there you go. You, just like that. Something like that. Okay. Okay. 
All right, so here's a question for you. We said that the rocket engine that makes these work is going to push out the nose cone like a piston and deploy the parachute. Well, that's a bunch of hot gas. We won't dwell on that one. <laughs> a bunch of hot gas that's pushing this nose cone out. What keeps this flimsy piece of plastic, which looks thinner than my garbage bag, from melting or getting peppered with hot air? And the answer is, we buffer that hot gas with some paper so that the paper takes the brunt of the heat and not the parachute. So I'm going to pass out some of that to show you what it looks like. This is called, look at this, they actually have this for sale. It's called Model Rocket Accessories Recovery Wadding. All right, can you do me honors with the scissors, please? All right, thank you. Now open this up. And I know you've never seen anything that looks like this in your life. I know. It looks like toilet paper. But do you know what it really is? Toilet paper? Toilet paper. Okay. <laughs> we think one of the most engineering marvels that Vern Estes, the owner of uh, Estes Industries, does, is find a way that how he was able to soak toilet paper in boron and sodium silicate. Uh, so that and the, and the paper, the integrity of the paper is still there. What happens is when it's chemically treated, it's still biodegradable, but it will not burn. And so that's an engineering marvel. What I'm holding in my hands right now, but it looks so. You have to use uh, flame-proof wadding. Otherwise, if you're using these rockets with tissue paper or bathroom tissue, you could be easily, you know, setting a cornfield on fire or something like that. If I run out of paper, I will, I will cry. Um, what's it treated with, or what's it treated with? Boron silicate. Anybody who's doing the aerospace engine uh, presentation? For some, you are. Sorry. You've been informed. So think about this. I am going to run out of paper. Yeah, Thank you. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. For the Chem 201? The Omega Man. Kevin, what are we going to do, buddy? Oh. Hold on here. You're going to have to rob Peter to pay Paul. Okay. They got some extra. Yeah, 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 can we let him tear off one end? And we all contribute to him. Yeah. All right. And there are cupcakes in the cafeteria, too. Okay. Yeah. How much do I need? Yeah, how much? I got that with my parent now. Yeah, you can be a little more generous than that. You don't like Kevin? Okay. All right, that's enough. That's enough. That's enough. That's enough. Got, now he's got more than you do. Okay. So what you're going to do now is you're going to take this and you're going to wad it up you know, into a little little ball. You know. And then just wad that up. You might even break it into parts if, if you have to. Long preparations. Wad that guy up there. Put it in there. Oh, you got more than you can shake stick in. They all do. All the way. So uh, what I'd like to do in a, is actually make it a blow gun and go. And, and, and if that doesn't work, then use your useless scissors to push it down. All right. So at this point, what, I, what you can do is you can decorate your rocket with uh, the decals. They're, they're not water decals. They're pressure sensitive. Just don't put them over the path of the launch lug. And the purpose of the launch lug, oh, we never even discussed that. We launch our rockets vertically. And we launch them on a rail. And the rocket is guided up the rail by that launch lug until the speed of the rocket is sufficient that the fins will take over. So if you block the end of your launch lug here with the decal, then that rail will not go into the launch lug. And while you're doing this, where can they buy these materials if they want to do this at home and blow in the neighbor's house? Mm -hmm. Actually, any of the hobby shops like Hobby Lobby or uh, Hobby Town, Michael sells it. AG Moore does not. But. Uh, so give me a list of some money and I get 25% discount. 25% discount. 
If you wanted to buy one of these rockets that we're building, guess what this little cheap rocket costs? You bought them individually? What do you think? You're, you're the pro. Nine bucks? Ten bucks? No, it's not 75. Okay, you wouldn't be here. The, the, the right answer is $18. Wow. Yeah, it was $4 when I was a kid. You know it is. You see, they, they make them in China now. Now, so, do they, so they, they do H um, check when they buy the rockets? Oh, no. Say again? Can they buy these rockets as an H minimum requirement? No. These are legal uh, all through the United States. All right, looking good. At this point, I will pass out the rocket engines, get you all set up. I have pre-prepped them. I put the uh, igniter in it. It's again, it's a thin little wire. We attach leads to a car battery. The wire glows red hot, like I said, and it glows like a filament, and that's what starts it up. All right, I'll pass out the engines. They go just like this. You insert them so that when the, the wires are sticking away from the engine hook and away from the launch lug. Now, I'll just each give you a rocket engine. Oh, that was hers. Okay, there's yours. All right, there you go. <laughs> These are single-use engines. We've used yours before. And <laughs> there you go. Excellent. Perfect, okay. Let me know when you're finished with that. No, I want I want the uh, these leads to go away from the hook and away from the, oh, okay, gotcha. the uh, launch lug. When you're finished, let me see what you got. Yeah, put it in all the way so that the excellent. Okay, okay, you're doing fine. Great. Look at his. Great. Super. Excellent. Great, great. Okay, here's the uh, here's how we do the parachute. You kind of make it the uh, make the parachute. What what do you call it? Triangular. Then fold it over again longitudinally, so you're making a little spike out of it. The one you got a nice little spike out of this. Then give it an accordion fold or a Z fold. Like a Z fold if you're English. And uh, like this. Triangular fold. And then stick the point in first. Follow that with the shroud lines, the string. And then lastly, the rubber band, the shock cord. Top all that off with the ogive nose cone. Launch lug. Okay, yes. Shock. Shock cord. Shock cord. Oh, that's really neat. Does that have to go? Yeah. So that you can get the nose cone. Okay. Oh, that's neat. Very good. Can you shove the elastic string in first? Say again, please. Can you shove the string in first? Yes, ma'am. I think we're about ready then. What questions do you all have? I think you all did really well. Why don't you give yourselves a hand? I think that was 
So basically what a rocket is, just, you know, cardboard tube, pretty much plastic nose cone, and they're going to be launching off black powder motors, so it's a little bit of black powder, actually burn slowly enough, it doesn't explode, it'll burn slowly enough to push all the gas out of a nozzle and launch a rocket straight up in the air. So you've got the fins on it, which keep everything stable. Um, and I got into high power rocketry, um, you know, as a hobby. You know, my, my dad got me into it. Um, I went well beyond, but it's, you know, it's a rocket. goes up, it's, it'll go up in the air, it'll slow down with gravity, and then it'll deploy an ejection charge, so blow the nose cone off, deploy a parachute, and then hopefully bring a rocket safely back to the ground so you can launch it again. Um, the ones that we're launching here are going up on one motor. This one actually has three. Unfortunately, I don't have any motors with the launch today. But when I do, it usually goes up to about 1,200 feet. If you're really interested, you can go into the, the STEM section of Blackboard. I posted up a link to, uh, to a high-power club that launched off the eastern shore. They have rockets that go up to about 15,000 feet and recover safely, hopefully. Um, they actually launched a world record off of that field. It was a 110 scale Saturn V. The thing was 36 feet tall, weighed 1,600 pounds, and cost about, about $13,000 to launch once. It had enough thrust to put a Volkswagen into the air about a mile. So uh, it's, it's really cool stuff. Um, like I said, if, if you're interested at all, you can buy those small rockets at Michael's and Hobby Shop. Um, it's really easy to get into. The instructions from this are great. And if you want to branch out, there's quite a few uh, websites online. You can buy parts or anything. And it's great to join a club so you can launch bigger and bigger stuff. Okay, thank you. All right, everybody behind Chris Stoll. All right. Yeah, I, I want a line like that. Dean Brown, you want to come up here? Do, do honors. Does he, does he send a waiver, by the way? Did he send a waiver? Yeah. Where's the waiver? Yeah. Where's the waiver? Where's the waiver? Where's the waiver? Can I walk over this way a little bit? Okay, we're going to launch. Uh, Dr. Raza Khan and Dr. No, oh, Maria Burgess's uh, STEM club and the kids STEM club or the students STEM club and Dean Brown is going to do honors with the first one on the rail and here's how it works Dean Brown you're raring to go and we'll give a loud countdown and then you just press that launch button and it should go at T minus five four three two one launch wow way up there arcing over L nice long streamer on it, heading right down towards that laptop. Wow. Okay, and that that starts our uh, our STEM club activity for 2011-2012 school year. Hooray! All right. Now we're going to have the students, and it's going to be Crystal. You're going to be on number one. I'm going to pull the plug, and let's see. Kate on two, Jenny on three, Justin, you'll be on four, Megan, you'll be on five, and Prince, you'll be on number six. Okay? And we'll start you on the next one. Wow. Okay, once you put the rocket over the rail, then you want to attach these clips. And I'll say it loud because I know you can't hear me. Terrible, aren't they? These clips are like little clothespins, and they go one on each wire that sticks out the back end. It makes no difference which goes where, just as long as they don't touch each other. Takes one, two, three, four. Okay. Uh, Crystal, you want to launch your own rocket? Okay. She's stepping up to the pad. 
We have continuity. Range safety is go. Let's start a countdown. 99, 98, 97. Oh, let's do it from 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, launch. Wow. Way up there. Well, I guess I need to catch it before it falls. Parachutes out. Oh, yeah, now. Oh, come on, catch it. Catch We're trying to develop track stars by this activity. Come on, you Chris, can you can do it. Catch it. Go for it. All right, Chris is going out there as uh, Crystal Surrogate. Chris, you could catch it. Come on. You can catch it. You don't need. You don't need him. To I can't it. see it. It's too high. Oh. Okay, well, we'll try to do that again. Now, uh, Raza, you gave me a cheat sheet, and I promptly lost it. <laughs> but tell me, I, I see some students here with the... Uh, are, are you with the police department? What are you taking these notes for? Oh, we'll return it with all the answers. You're going to get an A. Okay. <laughs> What do we got here? The, uh, your, what's the class? Uh, what, who's your teacher? Uh, Miss Barker. Miss Barker. All right. Well, Miss Barker is put for her math class. Uh, what makes the rocket launch? Here are the questions. I can't launch because I got an airplane flying overhead. Uh, describe the direction the rocket is launched toward. What are the effects of changes in that direction? Three. What causes the rocket to descend back to Earth? What technique is used to slow this descent and why? And then be creative, sketch a pattern of one of the rocket launches that you've seen before. And then cleverly, she's put down here at the bottom uh, a polynomial expression. The height is equal to 64 times the time minus 16 times the time squared. We're using that expression, how high has the rocket gone after uh, three seconds? And this young lady has, has figured it out to be 192 feet. And when will the rocket hit the ground? You can kind of predict that as well. So there, there is ways that you, if you use trigonometry, you can use the sine formula and the tangent formula to calculate how high the rocket went up. Uh, the class of the STEM students here, we talked about three laws of motion that Sir Isaac Newton talked about. He said that a body at rest will stay at rest, and a body in motion will stay in motion until it's acted upon by some force like gravity, air resistance, and uh, or what else? Otherwise, they just keep on going up. Gravity and air resistance are the principal ones. And the other force that's going on is, is the direction of uh, propellant that's uh, powering it. Because for every action, there's an opposite equal reaction. And the uh, change in the body's direction is due to the uh, magnitude. It's proportional to the magnitude of the force and then the direct direction of that force. So when gravity and air resistance... Uh, hit those rockets and affect them, and otherwise uh, the rocket would continue going right up to the moon and we'd have uh, uh, Nobel Prizes for each of you. All right, who's on two? And it is Kate, right? So Kate is on two. We will cycle the rack. We're ready for two, and help me with Kate's count at five, four, three, two, one, launch. You need to catch before it falls on the ground. All right, Kate is off to the races, or not. You're better than Chris. Now you can see that while Kate's rocket's coming down, we guide the rocket up the first three feet of flight by a rail. Splashdown here at Carroll College. We use the rail to guide the rocket up the first three feet of flight until the fins will take over, kind of like feathers do on an arrow. There is a rocket engine in the back end of the rocket, and uh, uh, we, we launch it by uh, electrical means. We have a thin wire that uh, is in the back end of the rocket engine, and it uh, glows red hot, and that's what starts the propellant, and the propellant is uh, essentially black powder. On three, do we have Jenny? Is that right? All right, Jenny is ready. Where's our airplane? I hear him buzzing around. He's over there. And he's fl flying away from us. So Jenny is ready to go, and the countdown has commenced at 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, launch. And there goes Jenny's rocket way up there. Parachute out, fully deployed. You guys are doing great. Why don't we give them all a big hand? Aren't they doing super? And we've got more to come. Hold it for us. 
Okay. Okay, Justin, are you next? All right, he's on number four. The pad is cycled to four. Range safety is go. The panel is armed. Time is running. At T minus five, four, three, two, one, launch. Oh. And the fins on the rocket act like uh, veins on a weather vane, so it would cock in that way. He, his straw was not at the longitudinal axis. It was off to the side, so the rocket went that way. But because the wind is going here, Justin, you should be able to get that one back with a broken ankle. Okay. And down the culvert he goes. All right. And you didn't think minus was important enough. And Megan, you're next, right? All right. Megan says, fortunately, she was here. So I heard what you said. So here we go. That's the launch button at one. At T minus five, four, three, two, one, launch. There goes Megan's rocket straight up as a dive. Arcing over, looking for the pot. I heard it. And the parachute is out. Good job, Megan. Just push him out of the way, Megan. He'll, he'll get it first if you don't. And there he goes. Oh, and that's how it got smashed fins. Okay, now we know. Meanwhile, on rail six, we have Prince, and he steps to the table. He, there's the launch button, and here goes the countdown for Prince's rocket at five, four, three, two, one, launch. Wow, a successful rack of rockets. Okay, Prince, you can catch this one. Great job, guys. I'm going to pull the safety plug so that the pad is unarmed. We've got an airplane coming in town, so that's just uh, fine. It's a good time to load up the rack, so you want to go next? All right. Yeah, go ahead, Jordan. You, Missy. Go ahead, Kevin. And Sam, do you have a rocket? Okay, yeah. You guys are really doing a great job. Yeah. Well, it doesn't make it. I put one for uh, Dean Browns because his was flying flat on the metal and I didn't want the electricity, but your clips are, are out, so you're, just make sure they don't touch each other. Yeah, because you want the electricity to flow through the wire, not through the clips. All right, I'll catch your picture here, Dean Brown. You know what that pole is for? <laughs> well, it is OSHA approved, but no. If, if they get it on a, a wire, we just don't. They're uh, honestly a uh, half of 500 million of these rocket kits have been sold since 1958. We've had seven deaths, all of them from high tension wires. The people trying to get those things. Other than that, it's pretty doggone safe. All right, here's our next group of victims. Okay, here's what we're doing. We're going to have this next rack, and then I have a, a few miscellaneous rockets that, that we want to see. And first up, we have Ethan, right? And Ethan, you're going to, we're going to put the safety plug in. We're going to check continuity. We're good to go. And so Ethan's rocket's on rail one. There's the launch button. And appropriately at five, four, three, two, one, launch. There goes Ethan's rocket. Holy cow, Ethan, great flight. Like a little flag coming back down right into our area. Oh, snatch from the jaws of death. Okay. Number two, is that you, Jordan? All right, Jordan's rocket's ready to roll on rail two, and the countdown has started at five, four, three, two, one, launch. Fantastic. Now, all these objects, whether it's a cannonball, whether it's a cannonball or a rocket, they all descend at the same rate. There's a mathematical formula for it. I'll let you in on the secret that they fall at the rate of 
32 feet per second per second, except for the first second because there's inertia, and then you have to uh, give it a half rating. It only goes 16 feet the first second. But you can calculate how high a rocket went up just by how long it takes it to come back down. All right, rail number three. Who do we have? And it's Sam. Sam is stepping to the wreck. He has the big rockets in the background, and Sam is ready to roll at five, four, three, two, one, launch. And there it goes, straight as a die, arcing over, parachute is out, and deployed. And Sam, we'll see you back here in November. Okay? Yeah, it looks like it's far out. Gosh, man, I gotta explain the jokes too? <laughs> okay, here's the fun. Well, maybe, maybe sooner than that. And he does. All right, good job. All right, who is on number four? All right, it is Kevin. Kevin, no pressure. Kevin, there's no pressure on this. That's an inside joke. Fortunately, we're outside. I want to introduce you to my wife. She's the gal with the umbrella there. Let's give her a hand. All right. We'll be here all evening, all right? It's all right. So Kevin's rocket's ready to roll on four at five, four, three, two, one. Launch. Okay, Kevin, you are catching your foot, right? <laughs> okay, Kevin, I did say no pressure. No pressure. Hey, I think it's great you guys came out to uh, help build rockets and understand them and a little mathematic. And uh, I want to especially give credits to the kids on the on the hill who were skipping class today. Uh, Dean Brown wants to talk to you. <laughs> And Missy's on five. We're going to have to wait for aircraft. Closer, closer. No, we, uh, one of our safety rules that we follow is that we, we don't aim at targets. Uh, we, we launch our rockets in a vertical manner, that we use electrical means, that we keep the rails either above eye level or that we cap them if they're lower than eye level. There's uh, about 15 safety rules that the National Association of Rocketry puts out to do these rockets, and it seems seamless the way we do it here today. But I follow all 15, and so do all the kids here. Uh, you, the question was, where do you get these model rockets? You can buy them at Michael's or any craft store, um, Hobby Lobby, Hobby Town, uh, and so forth. Uh, they ru they'll run about $20 or so. Uh, Missy, I don't want to keep you holding up here, so why don't we go on to rail number five? Okay, so Missy's ready for rail five, and this is the launch button. We'll start the count at five, four, three, two, one, launch. Fantastic. All of our students prepped. They built these rockets an hour ago and put the parachutes in and did everything. He's eyeballing it. He's running like a like a like a demon, a very slow demon. Okay, and he's got it. Great job. Okay, all right. This is the ringer here. This is uh, this is our math teacher here. Let's see how she does compared to you guys. Okay. Unless it explodes. Yeah, unless it. Don't say that. Okay, you know where the launch button is. All right, right. The one, the one that says launch. That's right. All right. So you. Yeah, you stand behind me. All right. Help us with the countdown. This is this is the math department head. Ready? Five, four, three, three two, two, one. Four. Launch. What happened there? Wow, well, you must have built your rocket better than anybody else's. Okay. I don't know. I, I, I think it maybe went to Mars. Remember, a body in motion will... Really, can you see it up there? The, the guy on the hill, is, he's either pointing at a, a crow or... It is dizzying, I know that. Okay, you're the only one that can see it, so 
<laughs> Wait till our other poor eyes. You still got it? No, he says it's still up there. It's right, and you're pulling my leg, aren't you? <laughs> oh, you see it? Where? Help me. It's going, it's going to land over there. Did you take that in a big plane while you were Where is it? Come on, people, help me out here. What did you put in there? It's nowhere. It's over there. Oh, it's like, oh, God. It's really far away, huh? Yep. Okay, well, good. Let's give her a hand. Wasn't that great? Okay. Now I have a few more rockets. I can't see it. It's that way. I'll put on for you. Yeah, that's back there. That's it. Oh, there you go. Right. Okay, here's some answers to some questions. Why did some of the rockets go off this way versus that way? Uh, we don't have much wind, so I, I discount wind as an, as an example. I noticed that, for instance, I think it was, uh, I, I, it wasn't Sam's rocket, it was, it was it yours, Justin? It, it headed out that way, and then it came out, but he, when, uh, the way these are attached on that rail is there's a little straw glued onto the side of it, which we call a launch lug. Well, his straw was a little off canter, so it wasn't along the longitudinal axis. It was off a little bit. That's why I stepped pat to the pad before he launched and looked at it, just to be sure that it wasn't the glue wasn't coming unloose. And because it was off canter, then the rocket would kind of corkscrew as it goes up. Right. And it's some of them, like Sam's went up straight as a die. It's because this was perfectly aligned. But then also we have a little bit of wind. You can't t tell from right here. And especially about even with the tops of the trees, that's what I look at. But it is blowing it this way. So the rockets would have a natural tendency is after they get up, they start heading into the wind because the wind will blow on the... Let me borrow your rocket, Kevin. The wind will blow on the, on the fin like a weather vane does. So it, it should naturally tend to head over towards that airplane is above our head. And then when the parachute comes out, because there is a slight wind, then it'll blow back down where Chris has been recovering. So that's a little bit of an explanation. Another explanation is we can vary, obviously, the power of the rocket engine. And so what happened was is I exchanged Maria's rocket engine with a larger one that was twice the power as what we were launching. We were launching eight rocket engines. They had about 2.5 newton seconds, and Maria's had about 5 newton second uh, thrust. Okay, so that's that's the reason for that. All right, I got one more rocket to put on the pad, and then we'll be ready to roll. Okay, thank you for waiting. Let's launch these. These are kind of interesting ones. I, I just brought some to uh, show you a little different uh, assembly. This one is called, uh, except for the nose cone, this is called a Big Bertha. Uh, this might, some of you have launched model rockets before and some of you this is new, but the Hobby has been uh, commercially available since 1958. And uh, believe it or not, that's when I started with it. I'm now in my 53rd year of launching these darn things. I think I'd learn after a while, right? Uh, and this kit, the Big Bertha, became commercially available uh, from Vern Estes and Estes Industries back in 1961. And so a lot of them have been sold. So here's what the Big Bertha looks like on rail one. It uses the same rocket engine that we used on Maria's uh, rocket, except that it has a, a much bigger plan form, such much more lateral area. And so as it accelerates, the drag force is doubles on it. Uh, again, that's the opposing force, and it's the uh, force equals mass times acceleration. So with that, we, should, we shouldn't see it go as high as we saw Maria's, but let's see. T minus five for the gold one with the black nose cone on rail one. Obviously, it's going to go in that direction and hopefully blow back at four, three, two, one, launch. All right, up, not as high. Parachute out, fully deployed. Those pieces of paper that are coming down are called recovery wadding. It's used to buffer the hot gas. Okay, and so that one came down, great. 
Number two, what will it do? It looks like a little flying saucer. And uh, this one's kind of interesting. It's entirely made out of styrofoam. It's called featherweight recovery. Instead of using a parachute or a streamer, it should just plop back down safely. However, it comes back near you, just uh, get away from it. Here it goes with two, our little raider, as it's called. T minus five, four, three, two, one, launch. There goes the raider. Heads up, please. Back up from it. Oh, I tried to get you. Almost got Jill. All right, so that's that was that. There was the raider. Heads up, please. Back up from it. Number three. Number three is called the Froton. And, uh, or no, it's called the Razor. And uh, what makes this one different, if you notice that the fins aren't real with fins, there are tubes glued on the side. So uh, we're going to see if uh, tubes work as well as fins on launching a rocket. Yellow and black on rail number three at five, four, three, two, one, launch. Way up there, arcing over. Streamer is out, fully deployed, coming back down to good old terra firma. Wow, nice try though. Give him a hand, wasn't that great? Number four is a payload model. You can put an accelerometer on your rockets and measure acceleration. You can put an altimeter in there and me measure bear by, by using air pressure. You know, air pressure is high, uh, lower. Uh, higher here than it is up there and by measuring the difference in the barometric pressure you can determine how high your rocket went. Also, if you want to see uh, Lincoln fly, you can put a five dollar bill in it. Okay, so here we go with the payload model on rail number four and panel is armed, time is running at T minus five, four, three, two, one, launch. All right. Oh my goodness gracious. And parachute is out. Really good. <laughs> Whoa! I, I love that one. That was a good one, man. Oh my goodness gracious. And parachute is out. Really good. It was almost a dance move. That was neat. Okay. Uh, you see the one on number five? Uh, I better be getting extra points for this, Dr. Raza. <laughs> this one is the, the piece de resistance. I have to go to French class and find out what that means. But uh, it's not the last one. I've got one rocket to launch before it. This one is another payload rocket, but this one, instead of carrying Lincoln, a uh, $5 bill or an accelerometer, it's carrying a fresh hen's egg right out of the ice box. Um, I, I had to sign off on it with my daughter this morning. She didn't want to give me the egg, but I got it anyway. I told her I'd bring it back. I think the yolk's going to be on her. Uh, so um, before I launch this, I want to sh show you a different type of payload. We're going to launch the glider. Here goes the glider. Now this one is a little ticklish, and I'll tell you why. It, it, yeah, it's, it's got to go up straight and the clips can catch the back end of the tail of this glider and then hold on to it and then the thing can go cockeyed. Uh, so I, I don't know if the clips are going to catch it or not. Uh, for safety's sake, I'm going to ask everyone to stand on this. The idea is it goes up like the space shuttle as a rocket and then the pod pops off with the streamer and then the glider comes back down. This is called a Delta D. So range safety is go. The panel is armed and time is running on rail number three at five, four, Three, two, one, launch. There's the boost phase. Oh no, phase. Okay. And then there's the glide phase. Right to the table. Isn't that something? Touchdown. How about that? That was fantastic. All right, now to the piece de resistance.
Rail number five. I gotta clip it up and we'll be good. Good to go. Oh boy, here we go. I want you to know this is the third time I have tried to launch an egg at Carroll College, and all two of the previous ones have worked beautifully. The egg is just smashed up. The first time, I didn't put enough tape around the, uh, the nose cone. That's what that blue stuff is. And so the egg just had a free fall. And the second time, oh, it was just, it was, it was not a pretty sight. So maybe third time is a charm here at Carroll College. This is the last flight of the day. Again, I want to thank the STEM club uh, uh, organizers and Dean Brown for coming out here. Dr. Ball couldn't come today, but uh, uh, he supports your activities and wishes you the best of success in your future academic and professional careers. And with that, let's give a big Carroll College uh, countdown at five, four, three, two, one. Now, that was a perfectly good countdown, but not as good as Carroll College can do. So let me hear it really loud now at five, four, three, two, one, launch. Holy cow. Oh, uh, Lordy. Okay. I thought it was supposed to go up higher than that. All right, let's see what happens here. He's got it. Oh, boy, oh, boy. I need to put a bigger engine on it than uh, than that. Yeah, let's see. And uh, of course, uh, students, those rockets that you built, those are your rockets. So you take those home. I don't want to see them again. And let's see what happens. Ooh, 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 ooh. What do you mean, I don't know. I need an impartial observer over here to to judge this. Does it have a face on it? It has a face. Oh no, Mr. Bill, let's see. Oh no. Oh no. He's okay. I don't know, let's see. Yeah. He wouldn't fit in it didn't fit in the nose cone when I put it in there. <laughs> oh no. But he hey, he made what do you it think? though. He survived. He survived. Jordan says it's okay. I think it is. I think it's a success. Good job, all right, you're in. Oh, and Chris brought back the glider. You're the man. Hey. Great. Took me a long time to build that box. <laughs> Ooh, oh, great. Like <laughs> right, Ethan. Well, that was a successful day, I think. Thank you so much. It's great, great meeting you. See you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah.